So as we get started, we want to welcome you all back to another Flourish live stream discussion where we bring, where Flourish Coaching brings a thoughtful voice into some of the, the issues that we're trying to navigate, particularly in this season of social distancing in the church. Uh, but really, I think uh, today's topic has, has brought application to how we lead um, our churches in politically divisive uh, communities and in politically divisive times. So uh, in a moment here, I'll introduce you to kind of our guests uh, today. Uh, but before we do that, if you uh, would like to stay in touch with Flourish, you can always sign up for our newsletter. We try to send out uh, an e-newsletter once a week. You can do that at flourishcoaching.org. That's where you can also find our blog with recommended resources and short articles meant for the renewal and effectiveness of local pastors. You can also find us uh, at our podcast, the Church Renewal Podcast. That's churchrenewalpodcast.org or in your Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Wormbug, EarPod, whatever way you're using podcasts today. I think I made up some of those. But those are some of the ways that you can find uh, Flourish and the work we're doing to encourage uh, healthy churches and uh, and church growth. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guests today and uh, ask, uh, we're going to, this will be a little bit more like question and answer interview format. I'm going to try to uh I'm going to walk with Matt through kind of their story of navigating some political, uh, some differences in political philosophy that were really emerging in his church. Um, but uh, just so you know a little bit about him, Matt Kerber is a pastor in uh, the PCA in Western Pennsylvania. He pastors at City Reform Presbyterian Church. Uh, City Reform was planted just over a decade ago, maybe almost 15 years. Uh, and Matt has been here since the planting. So he is one of those guys that both planted and uh, stuck around. Um, he leads a team of pastors and staff there. They're uh, really effective in their discipleship ministry and they've, they've grown a lot as a congregation. I've personally benefited from Matt's friendship and his church's ministry. And so we're really glad to welcome Matt on to uh, uh, our discussion today. Matt, welcome to uh, our, our live discussion today. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, what you're doing here, I'm thankful for uh, Flourish for, uh, and for Alan personally. It's been a, a blessing to me as well. So, so Matt, can you help me make sure I get the details right? Uh, how old is City Reform Church? How long have you been there? Sure. Uh, City Reform just had its 16th anniversary this past February. Um, the core group gathered and was meeting before I arrived. Um, uh, we had a, a ruling elder who was a professor at Pitt, gathered together a group of people. I was the first pastor um, at the time. Uh, people introduced me as, the, as their young pastor, um, <laughs> and they don't do that anymore. So 15 years later, I'm just sort of uh, plugging along here. Um, I'm not a natural church planter, and uh, people talk about the characteristic, typical characteristics of the church planter. Uh, they do not describe me. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not so much a, a noble thing that I'm still here as I just know I'd never want to plant a church again. <laughs> that's, that's good to know about yourself. That's yeah. good. And in reality, I, I benefited from a really strong team of people that, that I was able to work with. Sure. They, uh, by personality and ministry style, I, I like to work with groups of people, um, interested in the various strengths and weaknesses and uh, uh, trying to facilitate teams. Um, so that plays out in the ministry in certain ways, but it, it also relates to the topic at hand today. How do we, how do we live together as God's people in uh, a divisive times? And um, I would say, I think it's really hard. And I've, I've felt a lot of pain and disappointment in this area. Um, and, uh, you know, I have some experiences and some ideas, but uh, this humbles me so much. And um, I, I still feel just a lot of pain and frustration in this area. Sure. Well, I, I really appreciate you be, being willing to be honest about that. You know, they say that um, the, the hour of worship on Sunday morning is one of the most divided hours in the country, whether that's churchgoers versus non-churchgoers, racial division, and even political division. It, it, in most communities, um, few churches are politically integrated. Uh, some are, but but in a lot of communities, they're not. They're, it, it, in a lot of places, there tends to be kind of a, a unifying politics and political view in a congregation, even though the church is not 
supposed to be an inherently political institution. Um, your church is in a in, is in a fairly unique community, especially for conservative, reformed, and evangelical churches. Could you tell us a little bit about um, the community in which City Reformed lives and ministers, and and how that uh, how that is a really neat place to see political diversity, ideological diversity within within the people you minister to? Yeah, um, we were planted with the express intention of being uh, for the city. The name of the church is City Reformed. Um, but at the same time, in the name, we wanted to keep a, a strong hold on our theological identity. So from the very beginning, there, there's, there was an intention to have a, a certain tension of uh, being uh, for the city, but even more specifically for the university and medical community. Pittsburgh has two hubs to it. The big skyline downtown hub, the business center, um, uh, is a place uh, where David uh, David Lee's church is is pretty closely related to. Um, we're in uh, just a couple miles away, maybe three four miles away. We're in uh, what's called the university hub of, uh, around Oakland. The major many many not all but many of the major hospitals are based out of here. University of Pittsburgh. Carnegie Mellon, a few other smaller schools are all centered in that area. Uh, so it's, uh, we're, we're intentionally located as much as possible in the university center. Um, as a uh, Reformed church, uh, uh, the Pres- you know, Presbyterian Reformed Church, uh, the PCA is um, on the spectrum of all American denominations, certainly more conservative uh, with strong uh, uh, convictions and and uh, uh, being governed and directed by uh, creedal statements. Uh, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with Presbyterians, but that was just a quick quick intro. So by and large, what that means is we are a theologically uh, conservative church in a socially um, more progressive area. Um, in some way, by design, is an intention that we embrace from the beginning. And I, I don't think we thought of it as being a way to, uh, uh, you know, build a place of political diversity. It was just thinking, well, we, we believe these things are true. We're gospel centered. We want to be tied and con- concretely tied to that. Um, but we also believe that there's an important need for Christians to be a witness in the university and medical center. So uh, I would say from the beginning, there was a sense of sort of missionary perspective um, and we had to do a lot of talking with uh, early on with folks who came from places where um, they had maybe very strong political convictions, often conservative political convictions, and um, maybe they had came from a church where that was what everyone thought, and they just assumed, and, and there was a meshing together of theological and, and political conservatism. So there was a fair amount of intentionality early on. Uh, to try to uh, help people to see that, you know, you may have these convictions that they may be true, but there's something more important than that. And that is of Jesus Christ. And we're going to prioritize uh, the message of the gospel over um, other convictions that we may have. Um, sure. So uh, over years, over the years, though, something that developed is, is, um, you know, we had a team of really faithful people that were praying and loving well and, and, uh, you know, we were, we were committed to trying to keep Christ central. As the church, church grew, we definitely grew with younger folks, young, uh, a lot of younger evangelicals. Um, and as we rolled in from 2015 into 2016, uh, uh, the associate pastor at the time, Rob Gray and myself, were, were talking about the church. And uh, we were having a conversation that said, I, I, I sometimes wonder if in our growth, and we're not a big church by any means, we may have been at the time uh, 250 uh, or maybe a little bigger now, but not much. Um, you know, you know, we're saying, I wonder if we've actually, because we had some quick growth in a certain period of time. And, and we said, I wonder if we've, we've grown in a way that some people uh, have, aren't, aren't sure what we really stand for, mm. you know, and, and, uh, so we began to suspect that maybe we were in danger of being uh, of losing our, our kind of grounding in our theological roots, and we spent the the winter going through a bunch of issues that we thought, well, you know, we got to make sure we put a a tent peg in the ground on this issue, and 
And as we did that, we our thinking was, well, we're going to, you know, before it gets too late, we've got to make sure people know where we stand. Now, can you remind us when, about, about what year was this? Did you say this was like 2015, 2016? Yeah, right. I would say 2015 into 2016. Okay. And the church at that point must have been, was, was it about its 10 year anniversary? That's right. That's okay. right. Just, yeah, a little bit more. Um, so it was an interesting process. We we did this thing we, we called it at the time our Presbyterian Identity Initiative. Uh, we're going to try and remind people what we believe in, you know, because, you know, sometimes people can get distant from things that are important if they don't come up all the time in the text. So we had an intentional series of classes and sermons, and we have a, a pretty important uh, to our churches, our group ministry, we call them community groups. We would actually visit community groups and talk a little bit about some of these things. We went through a number of stuff like uh, uh, church discipline and uh, Calvinism. And uh, we even uh, did it around that time, maybe a little earlier. We had done a series on uh, uh, meeting with people in their small groups, talking very explicitly about uh, sexuality and gender, or particularly homosexuality and and uh, biblical commitments to it. So uh, and determined to be gracious and supportive and all that. But um, so we had walked through some things and that, uh, uh, not much was stirring people up, but that that spring, uh, spring of 2016, uh, right as the school year was ending, we did a seminar on gender and ministry, gender differences between men and women. It's a topic I had done in years past. Uh, it's a topic that was pretty clear uh, our, as a de- church and a denomination. We have a clear commitment on, on differences, differences between men and women in ministry. I thought it was clear. And we did this seminar. And it, it blew up on us. Mm. And uh, I'm not sure all of the reasons why, but it was, I, I share the whole story to say it was sort of funny. We were, we were like going along, poking at things, being like, where's their difference? What are we, what's going on here? And um, when we hit that issue, it got really hot. And uh, it turned out that I think there were a collection of people that had come to think they knew what we believed in a church about men and women, but I think they believed we were going to change or something. Mm. Uh, So it was the first issue that started to bring things out. Um, And it led into a season of, uh, of great division in the church. Yeah. Um, and, And a lot of that division ended up, moving towards uh, uh, political and cultural issues. Right. So I would say, just to summarize here, what was important for me to realize, some of the issues that we used to think of as being divisive were not particularly divisive for my people. Uh, we could talk all day about Calvinism and Arminianism, and no one really got too upset about it. It wasn't like the hot issue. Um, when I was a young Christian, those were like, those conversations got heated. Um, but when we started to get around issues that were cultural, then the heat really went up. And I think the reason that the, our gender and ministry topic got was so difficult is it had a lot of cultural tie-ins for people. It had to do with how people live in the world. Um, how, how do we view uh, justice? Mm-hmm. How do people relate together? There was just tremendous uh, uh, touchiness around those issues in ways that I hadn't anticipated. Um, and in ways that I could clearly say, even in at that time, what was the 10 year history of city reform? It was different in 2016 than it was in 2006. Yeah. I can say that very confidently. Sure. There was a, there was a change. There was a cultural shift. There was a, younger people with new concerns emerging and the way in which we talked about this stuff uh, uh, was very different than it had been. So, so you all were uh, an urban center, university center church. You're going through this identity initiative, trying to help 10 years into the church plant, uh, church establishment, uh, re, re- kind of bring back to the surface. Hey, this is, this is our identity. This is who we are. This is what we believe. 
And oh, by the way, uh, gender roles and ministry, that, that's one of the issues that we have a particular belief about. And oh, by the way, it's 2016, and it is one of the most polarizing elections that's happening in the country. And the issue of gender and men and women is right at the forefront of that political discussion. The first female presidential candidate from a major party, um, a a discomfort among many evangelicals with the way that the more traditional, the candidate they would more traditionally support in Donald Trump uh, spoke about in his history with with interaction with women. Do you feel like you are trying to do a, a theological, biblical, cultural conversation and this political conversation just kind of kept pressing into it as well. Did you feel that kind of tension, internal, external? How, how, did, that, how did that external political reality seep into and, and affect what was going on inside your attempt at uh, uh, you know, a, a biblical and cultural discussion in the church? Well, I'm going to sort of answer your question. Sure. Uh, and l- let me put it this way. Here's what I... Here's what I realized out of this and here's what you know our ministry team was realizing is that the driving concerns uh that animated the the population of our culture particularly uh you know 30 and under the millennial generation the central driving concerns that animated their worldview and their their what was really important to them were different than what i grew up with um, so I'm classic Gen X. Uh, you know, I grew up in the '80s. If you ever watch Stranger Things, that is my childhood on that show. Like the music, the people, the all that stuff. Uh, we didn't have aliens in our town, but you know, except for that. Um, uh, and I didn't even think in terms of generational realities that much. And of course, not everyone in a certain generation thinks the same thing. But what I use that to say that there, there, there really was a noticeable difference. And I suddenly realized uh, a lot of our ministry was the people that had different concerning uh, uh, central core concerns. So just to give an example, I was in college in the 90s, and the really, really big discussion of the 90s was um, you know, whether or not we could know true things for certain. And uh, the the lang and the sort of the language of tolerance was hotly debated. So in the '90s, uh, late '90s, early 2000s, um, for for Christians, the, the big concern was defending Christianity against postmodernity. Um, and we we wrote books about absolute truth. We, we we talked about that all the time. How can you know something true? Is anything really true? Or is it just you know, uh, uh, just a bunch of opinions. Uh, you know, I'm not everyone's on video, but you know, hands of people that remember, remember that, right. Fighting, fighting, fighting for truth. So for a long time, I, that's what I grew up in. And that's what my early ministry was. And I always assumed we were trying to convince people who were relativists that something was true. And I think the biggest marking difference that happened in this next generation, this cultural shift, all, I mean, it was not just people growing up who were different, but they were changing. People in our church were changing in the midst of a change in culture. Uh, we had, I think, around the, the mid 2000 teens, uh, uh, a cultural revolution similar to the 19, late 1960s. Like there was a big, big change and how people viewed things as they grew, as people were growing up and as they're changing together. So here's one feature that we can trace and to to notice the change. I think it's the most central one. If my generation, Gen X, was raised to believe nothing was true, and we were were, uh, by nature somewhat cynical and apathetic and everything was relative, the the next movement and both of people and, and, and changed thought was one that had incredible certainty about what was true and a real sharp concern for justice. So, uh, you know, if you can imagine, uh, you know, you're going into a, a war and you think that the enemy's on the ridge over here and uh, you, you've turned your cannons at that ridge and you've lined up your soldiers with their bayonets, I'm thinking like, 
a Napoleonic or Civil War kind of battle. Uh, you're aiming to go over that hill and suddenly you realize the enemy's not on that hill at all. In fact, they're on the hill behind us. And so what was happening was so disorienting for me and for many people is that the accusations and the disagreements and the charges were coming not entirely from a different direction, but a substantially different direction. Where previously Christians had been viewed as being sexually prudish and uh, uh, arrogant in their assumptions of truth, now Christians, conservative Christians, were being charged with uh, uh, you know being part of an oppressive sexual and social system that that oppressed women. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to, for some of us, you realize that's really disorienting because in the nineties, uh, when the only people speaking against pornography were Christians, uh, we were acu- accused of being prudish. We didn't get on with the sexual revolution. And now, uh, people look at us and say, you're the, uh, you're the, 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 um, folks carrying this old patriarchal tradition, uh, that subjects women sexually or something. It, it's, it's, you know, when you're in those conversations, it's sort of disorienting. Um, but the same thing on, on you know, on justice. Um, any claim of justice is necessarily a claim of truth. Uh, when, when you talk about your desire to see justice and you want to battle injustice, you're working in a rubric of truth and in essentially absolute truth. You're saying, I, I want to impose justice on you. Now, for Christians, I think we inherently believe that. We say there is a truth. God is just, and, and he, he wants to conform the world to his character. Um, but for, you know, for many years, we were fighting our battle one way, and then this, the, the pendulum swung, and the accusations are coming in from the other side. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I would say that what, what, it was a really disorienting shift, um, and uh, it was, I think, one of the things that made it a hard period is that the, the conversation shifted in a really dramatic way. Now, for us, it, it seemed to happen quickly, but for many of these folks, these are conversations they had been in for a long time. This was happening in their college and university settings. They're, they're, they're being challenged to think in terms of equity and justice. Um, but because that those were historic Christian concerns, we didn't immediately pick up on the fact that, no, this is a really different thing happening here, um, a really different worldview. Mm-hmm. Sometimes overlaps with Christianity, and at times is, is very different. So as, as you and your pastoral leadership team, you know, this is four or five years ago, are, are working through some of these cultural issues, you're seeing these, these kind of tensions emerge in your own congregation. Um, they're... they're as you're as you're realizing that there are these political and cultural distinctions that are that are emerging in the in the group of people that you love and pastor, um, what was that experience like? And could you kind of walk us through that 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 year, 2016? These these debates are emerging within your church. Um, how, how did you, as a leadership team, navigate that? What did you do? I, I have a Quick metaphor. I have a, I have a raised bed garden in my backyard. It's up against the garage and it has, you know, one by fours on three sides of it. And uh, it's eight feet long. So I have two four foot one by fours kind of holding the dirt back. But every time the rain comes off my roof, you know, they're, they're, the dirt is pressing up against my, my raised bed garden. So I've been shoving rocks against it, trying to keep it all together. What did you as a leadership team, as pastors, do to try to keep things together as these, as these, uh, these convictional differences in your people started to emerge? Well, I mean, uh, I guess I could say some things that, that, that may, you know, I could present it in a way that, that sounds really noble and good. But the truth is we just tried to survive. Um, and uh, I think as I look back what we began to realize needed to happen uh, is we needed to have a vision of God's kingdom that was distinct and separate from our political motives. And um, 
I, I gave a couple of refer uh, references to Alan. Uh, um, I think uh, the one of the things that, set, that I was familiar with before that settled into me this period is a, uh, a perspective on cultural engagement that probably many people have used, uh, something that Tim Keller has talked about. And I always thought of it as a sort of a gimmick. He would talk about the way uh, there's a, a traditional forces at work in the world and there are um, progressive for secular forces and they are uh, at war with each other and Christianity is presenting a third way. Um, perhaps you've heard Tim Keller, this introduction to the, the reason for God uh, just kind of explains that clearly and nails it, uh, I think. So I'd always heard it and I thought about it. Um, and I, I didn't grasp how insightful he was there. Um, any of you who've ever been overseas, uh, uh, you recognize some of these things. Like there are really traditional places in the world that are not friendly to Christians. You know, I've, I've been blessed to have opportunities to minister in Muslim settings. They are conservative, but they're not Christian at all, you know? And then uh, one, one trip I did, um, I went from... Uh, northern Iraq and the Kurdish region back to Europe. And as I moved through, it was like whiplash seeing uh, uh, traditional and secular worldviews next to each other. They're so different. And again, if you've ever interacted with people, I'm sure you have, but um, the traditional Muslims look at Christians and they think we are just like every American. We're just kind of wild, secu secular, immoral people. And the secularists look at us and they think we're just like the radical Muslim fundamentalists, right? That neither of them have a concept that there could be something outside, outside of these two forces in these two camps. Um, and, I, and, and so I do, I just, I'm really convinced that that sort of third way approach, God's kingdom is being neither rooted in enlightenment secularism nor in traditional nationalism, there, there, you know, there are very different ways for human sin to go wrong. And right now they are warring in the world. So I would say the general thrust that started that fall and it's continued, and it's just, it's, it's hard and it's slow because we live in a place where the greater the tension gets, the, the greater the, the urgency people feel to make this polarized fight all, all, everything, right? If you're not with me, you're against me. If you are not taking this political position I'm holding, uh, and if it's not driving everything you have, you must be the enemy. Um, yeah. That, that tension, which was starting in 2016, has just continued, and it's probably going to get harder um, as we move through the summer and fall. But there's this sort of urgency where, where people essentially see the political battle they're involved in as being ultimate. And when that happens, we are actually displacing God's kingdom. Uh, uh, I think we can see so much in the New Testament, particularly in the New, you know, I think of the New Testament, particularly about how uh, the, you know, the conservative Jewish people of Jesus' day had a vision of the kingdom that was that was one to one with national Israel and their concerns vis-a-vis -vis the Roman Empire. I mean that was animating polarizing uh, controversy they were involved in, and, uh, and so I think I think we really do see these models in ministry where you know Jesus on on one hand he kind of agrees with the scribes and Pharisees about their doctrine of God, you know he. he he, he has many points of overlap, but on the other hand, uh, their vision of the kingdom and how they relate to the Gentiles and, and the, the prideful way they relate to their own spirituality is completely off. Yeah. So I'm sorry, long, no, long story great. there. The, the, in my view, you know, that, that central thing just keeps going into what, what we're doing now. And that is, uh, I would say that the theological project is to challenge people to center their political convictions so that God's kingdom and gospel purposes can be recentered. And the reason I chose those words very carefully because um, the I think the challenge we're facing 
is that often we're, we're we find ourselves disagreeing with people about a worldview, even when we have certain principles that are the same that, that we affirm. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, we, we uh, I, I'm convinced as Christians we have to affirm what we will call traditional views of sexuality and gender, the biblical views of sexuality and gender look traditional to people. I'm okay with the word. Um, uh, you know, there are also folks that would champion that and uh, and do it in a way that is not related to the gospel. There are a lot of people in our culture today who are deeply concerned about issues of racial justice and equality. I'm convinced as Christians, this is a central concern. This is new, like on, on every book of the New Testament, how are the Jews and Gentiles relating? How are people groups relating? Um, you know, it's a really big concern in, in our church. The American church has, has a long history of failing in this area. So we've got to take it seriously. Um, and yet there are also, I think, ways that uh, uh, the, the, that very concept itself can be co-opted into another system that, that doesn't relate to the gospel. So often what we, we're doing that's so hard is, is not that we're outright disagreeing on, all, on some of these things but we are decentering them. We're saying, yes, that's important. Yes, that's true. But God must be central. If we lose that, if we lose the unique proclamation of the gospel, uh, we, we lose the core of who we are. So, so as, as you, so, so your experience with these, these political divisions really emerging in your church, it really called you to bring the kingdom of God to center this, what you, what you described as what Keller calls a, a third way. Um, it, it seems to me that this, uh, this thing we call political polarization is very hungry. It keeps eating more and more things. Um, and right now the thing political polarization seems to be eating is public health. Um, that, that somehow, uh, individual and community responses to a public health issue have become left and right versus some people versus, you know, so if I'm on the left, I have to have this view. I'm, if I'm on the right, I have to have this view. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is it seems like what you're saying is we need to decentralize our po politics and make the kingdom of God central. But but our politics keep wanting to get back to the center again and again and again. Um, you mentioned some resources to me uh, for folks on the call today. I'm going to put them in the chat. There's already a couple links there now. If you open up the chat window, I'll put a couple more in. But you've mentioned a couple different resources to me. We're uh, including an article from Carl Truman and a, uh, a series of sermons from Reinhold Niebuhr. Were any of these particularly helpful to you as you were trying to call people out of polarization and toward a centrality on the kingdom of Jesus? Yeah, I would say very helpful for me, uh, only moderately helpful for others. Um, so I would say here's the reality of our church is 2020. We are simply not as politically broad as we were four years ago. Um, I, I would say there are victories where some people have said, you know, uh, I realize I've been so wrapped in politics, I've forgotten about Jesus. You know, you, you get that. And folks, kind of, I, I, mean, I see that happening. So, yeah, I see it happening. But the truth is, we also lost people. There were folks for whom uh, uh, their own political worldview was more important than the kingdom. And now, I know when I'm saying that, uh, you know, I'm open to charges of like, all right, your view, you're, I, I can be wrong on stuff. I know that. Um, but I do, I, I think it, it's actually really the true thing that was happening. Um, and, and you begin to see, you're, you know, someone's describing what's really animating them and, and yourself thinking, you know, nothing you just said in that half hour monologue had anything to do with Jesus, the cross and the resurrection. In fact, you could have that viewpoint and not have the resurrection. Um, it's just, it, when that, when that's happening, I think that's, that's sort of the, the evidence that this is, uh, a person has become so wrapped up in politics, lost their view of the kingdom. Now, so with that said, um, there's, I think there has to be room in the Christian church for a diversity of views on different political issues. 
um, you know, we, we have to be able to say there's something more important. I'm willing to talk to so agree with me. So um, here, I'll just reference the three articles, uh, three things I, I gave. Uh, I do want to briefly say something about them. Uh, uh, Elliot Clark, Evangelism as Exiles. Uh, I thought this was an excellent book. Um, it, 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 what he's doing is he's moving through the missions angle to get at this. And it's a really, really helpful approach. He was a former missionary in a, uh, a, a closed Muslim country. So he was spent years ministering to people where Christianity was completely outsider. And, and he's, I think it's a really helpful lens. If we want to decenter the political debate, many Christians can, can em, still embrace the beauty of God's worldwide mission. You know, churches that get excited about missions are well prepared to be able to view our own political issues a little more detached. And we say, wow, you know, um, the God's kingdom is bigger than our country. You know, that's, that's, that's the sort of movement. I think it's a really, really helpful way as we celebrate world of missions, world evangelism, God's kingdom throughout every tribe, tongue, and nation. Um, that's, we're playing, as evangelicals, we're playing to our strengths. We have a history there. Um, you know, I think of uh, David Lee's church, Christian Missionary Alliance, like they're so much wrapped up in their, their church is mission. So I think that's a helpful angle uh, for, for many of us. Um, I referenced a series of sermons by Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, uh, I'm reading that because my uncle is trying to engage with me. I only read one. I only read the first sermon. And my understanding is Niebuhr is sort of uh, neo-Orthodox. Uh, I'm, I'm not recommending him as a whole. I don't know anything about the rest of the book. But his opening essay on intellectual humility and political power from, I think, the late 1940s was really interesting to read because he's so much outside of our immediate setting um, and yet makes some really relevant things. So I'd recommend that opening article. I can't say anything about the rest of the book. It was just refreshing to read a, a political analysis from the 1940s that was fearful of uh, human arrogance turning our own pet systems into God's kingdom. Uh, it was, it was, it was helpful, at least. And uh, finally, I mentioned a short article by um, Carl Truman. Uh, the point he makes there, much better than I would make in summary, is the, the heart of Marxism is it makes everything political. And he, he's got this provocative angle on it, which is to say, if you think that you're being anti-Marxist, but you've made everything political. You've actually given in on Marx's biggest point. Uh, and that is, and so it's a, it's a very thoughtful political argument, so to speak, that decenters, right? And, and that inherently to be, uh, uh, to have a view of God's kingdom, to believe in God's sovereignty is to believe are things not directed by political power, such as the gospel and the kingdom of God, not advancing by the power of the sword that are nonetheless very important. So uh, it's, a, it's a recent article. It's just from last year. I thought Carl Truman is a, a you know, reform guy, a, a biblical guy, a British guy. He has some interesting takes on things. Great. Well, thank you for those resources. In a moment here, I'm going to set uh, change the settings. And so if folks want to unmute themselves and offer a question or comment, you'll be able to do that. Um, after a little bit of time for that, we'll uh, wrap up with prayer. So we'll take about maybe another five, 10 minutes before we wrap up here. Let everybody uh, get, get a break from Zoom meetings. But before uh, I do that, Matt, can I, we've talked a lot about um, the big picture, the, the theology and the theory of navigating political differences in our churches. Could you, could you kind of close, and maybe there's a particular episode that would crystallize this, um, and maybe not, but could you, could you close with, and, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting to you or to anyone else that you've done this perfectly. Um, okay. That's enough caveats. Could you yeah. close with, um, some practical uh, advice for how to engage 
a member of the congregation whose politics really are taking center over King Jesus. Um, if there's a, if there's an episode that crystallizes your learning from that, if there are some strategies you've learned from, from your experience in your church over the last five years, but could, could you give us some practical pastoral advice? I've got someone in my church who I really think their politics are, are, are center, not the kingdom of Jesus. How do I engage that person? Well, um, let, let me let me say what we're trying. Let me give you an example here of something we're, we're we've been doing. Uh, we've already been doing in the past, and we've been trying to build up. Uh, and it's actually this this Sunday uh, is um, this Sunday is a, a, a holiday in the church calendar called Pentecost Sunday. Um, not generally recognized in American churches, but in many uh, evangelical and, and historically Protestant churches in Europe, uh, Pentecost Sunday was up there with uh, Christmas and Easter, and uh, uh, as as the the event where we recognize the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the church and the equipping of God's people for their ministry to the nations. So um, we've uh, we've chosen to celebrate Pentecost Sunday for a couple of years and. And we see that as in line with the sort of great evangelical holidays of Christmas, Easter, and then the third, which we missed was Pentecost. So beyond that, we're not super into the church calendar, but we've made uh, Pentecost Sunday a missions Sunday. Uh, and uh, you know, some people come thinking, oh, we're going to debate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we say, no, listen, the whole point of, of those gifts was that people heard the gospel in their own language. This is the empowering of God's people for their mission of bringing in the harvest of the nations. So we've just chosen to make it a, um, uh, a mission Sunday. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have, uh, this, I'll just say this to get your attention. We do have uh, a praying in tongues um, in which we have people in, in the congregation who were born with another language pray and then translate. So we're, you know, we're, Presbyterian Church, uh, we're really, uh, uh, you know, kind of cessationist, I think you could say, but we think it's a pretty interesting thing to do. And we remind ourselves, you know, we're in an international community. We have an awful lot of members that, that spoke another language before they spoke English. It's a, it's a gift. So we try to feature them. They, they do a short prayer in English. They do a short, uh, a short prayer in their own language and a short prayer in English. And we're just remembering, oh, yeah, the church is bigger than us. So I, I mentioned this before with Elliot Clark, but I do think when we choose to celebrate the church around the world, um, we have the, the opportunity to try to decenter people from their own political divisions. And, and I think there are ways that this appeal can resonate on, on folks in different places. Uh, I think there's a really godly biblical way to celebrate the beauty of, of different cultural diversity, different ethnic groups, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And, you know, to some, some of our folks that, that may be more uh, on a progressive political side, often they're kind of uh, uh, oriented towards recognizing that as good. So I think there's a way that celebration can start to bring people in. To, to folks that are maybe more oriented on a politically conservative side, often we can uh, move towards them through their high view of scripture, or at least their uh, default position that we should have a high view of scripture. Uh, and and we, when we see the story of the Bible as a story of God's kingdom going from one man to all the nations, and that is the defining story of our lives. So I think the, the more we can see that story as the story, then we can take some of the pressure off our own political battles. And, you know, I would want to say carefully, when we decenter, we're not saying these battles are unimportant. There are truth issues at stake. There are matters of justice at stake, but they can't carry the weight that our political polarization wants to put on them. They can't ultimate. Only God the gospel, his kingdom, and this big, you know, worldwide story, only that can be ultimate. 
Um, so I think that that's one of the ways that, you know, through that angle, we can sort of invite people into a, a different perspective on what's happening to us right now. That's great. Matt, thank you so much for being willing to share some of the learning you've had along the way here. And, um, and thank you for being honest that it hasn't been an easy process, that it hasn't been a nice and simple process, but it, but it really has. It's obvious as someone just listening to you tell that story, the way God has used it to shape your thinking and, and your ministry and your congregation. We hope folks on the call today were really benefited by Matt's story. Um, in a moment here, we're going to open up the lines and uh, anyone that wants to kind of hang out. It's, it's almost like the parking lot after the meeting. We'll uh, let folks ask questions or interact. Um, I'm going to close us in prayer. And if you have to sign off, you're welcome to, obviously. But if you'd like to stay on and interact, uh, I think, Matt, you can give us another 10 minutes of your time, right? Sure, to interact sure. if anybody wants yeah. to. Great. Um, in the meantime, if you want to catch the recording of this, if you if you missed part of it, or if you'd like to hear the recordings of any of our weekly discussions, uh, you can find them on the Church Renewal Podcast. That's churchrenewalpodcast.org or in any of the podcast streaming services. You can always reach out to us at Flourish on the web, flourishcoaching.org. Find out more about the ways that we try to see the church renewed in the gospel. Uh, you know, there's only one fully sufficient reason that this day dawned, and that is that Jesus is still gathering the people to himself. And the ordinary way he does that is through the church. And that's why we try to um, encourage, equip uh, pastors and, and ministry leaders with these kind of ideas and topics because because Jesus is using you through the work of the church to gather his people. And that is something we're really excited about. All right. Thank you everyone for joining. I'm going to close this in prayer and then we'll open the parking lot. Father, thanks for an opportunity to hear uh, Matt and his church's story and experience navigating really difficult cultural and political issues. Um, we thank you, Father, that you have uh, given him humility and a willingness to share that story. We pray for the guys on the call, those who are uh, lay leaders and pastoral leaders and those support the church from the outside um, as as equippers of pastors. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you would give us wisdom uh, in how to help our people navigate uh, with Christ and his kingdom at the center and uh, all of our secondary issues really as secondary. Uh, Father, we pray that you would be glorified in the work of the church. And so we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, and by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.